Following on from the videos on the new controller, here's a new version of the DIY BMS cell monitoring module. This one will be known as version 4.4, um, so the first thing to point out is that this version is fully backwards compatible with the existing controller. If you're already running a DIY BMS, there is no need to rush out and upgrade or replace what you have. In this video, I'll explain how to order the almost fully assembled modules, what you have to do when you receive the modules, and then how to program them and connect them to the controller. It's probably going to be a longer video than I normally do, so let's get on with it. First of all, let me explain why I made this version. It's been a little bit confusing having two existing designs, either version 4 or the 4.21 boards in existence. Revision 4 was the original design, and they still work great. Um, it was built using uh, larger service mount components, which made it very easy to assemble by hand. The 4.21 board, on the other hand, was designed for mass assembly using tiny parts, which would, would be a nightmare to do by hand. The new version is a combination. They use slightly larger parts, so they can still be hand built, but are also suitable for automated assembly. Physically, the boards are a little larger than the previous version, the same width, just a little longer. All modules have a connection for an external temperature sensor, but I noticed not many people were actually using it. There was some confusion over what was needed to make it work, and the connections to the, to the sensor were a little ugly. I've solved that problem with a little snap-off corner on the new module, and we'll look at that later on. Other improvements include an onboard fuse, a TVS diode, which helps protect the module from electrostatic and voltage spikes, um, and an external crystal, which provides a uh, stable clock frequency to the microcontroller. This should improve communications and uh, also allows higher speeds in the future. The other improvement worth mentioning is the increase in balance current. It's only a little higher uh, than the 4.21 boards, um, and ultimately we're still limited by the heat the board generates when bypassing. For the ordering process, I'm going to use JLC PCB. This video isn't sponsored by them, but I do have a discount code you can use. It uh, gives a few dollars off, off each order. So let's get the files to build the module. As usual, they are on GitHub. You can see I've recently restructured the folders so it's easy to find what you want. The, the uh, new module code is in the version 4.4 folder. First of all, we're going to need to get the gerber.zip file. So download that to your computer. And if we go up a folder, you will also need the uh, BOM and CPL files. So download those as well. Now, if we go over to the JLC PCB website, uh, if you've not already registered for an account with them, I'll do that now, otherwise you'd be asked to do it later and it just gets a bit annoying. Here we can upload the Gerber file and wait for JLC to show it to us. You can select how many boards you want. Um, I'll select 15 in this example. You can leave the rest of the options as the defaults, although let's change the surface finish to lead free so we can be a bit more environmentally friendly. If you want to hand build the modules, this is where you would stop and just click the save to cart. Um, obviously you're going to have to do all the soldering yourself and, then, and order the uh, spare parts you need as well. If you want JLC to assemble the boards for you, and to be fair this is by far the easiest option, scroll down the page. So we tick the SMT assembly option. We need to select the top side of the board and tick the agreement box and then confirm. Now we'll upload the bill of materials, otherwise known as the BOM, and the component placement files. After a short while, JLC will show all the parts they have in stock and which they're going to build and place for us. As we can see, the Attani chip is out of stock. Uh, unfortunately, this is quite normal. Um, you'll have to order these separately and solder them, them on by hand. If there are any other parts missing, please stop here and, and don't continue with the order. Just wait for the stock to become available in the future. Unless, of course, you know what you're doing and you're confident in your, in your abilities to be able to pick a different part. So now we click next and we're shown an image of where all the parts will be placed. You can zoom in and see the details if you want. As expected, the at tiny is missing. You can also see that the through hole parts like the connector sockets are missing. These will need to be added later. Don't worry about the little circle 
circle on the uh, bottom left of the board. Uh, this won't actually exist, it's just an issue with the Gerber viewer on JLC website. At the bottom of the screen you can see a breakdown of costs. It will also tell you all the parts which are not fitted. And on the right hand side is the cost breakdown. So, so for 15 boards the cost is just over 55 US dollars. Uh, but don't forget you also got shipping and taxes on top of that. Now you can click save to cart and continue the checkout process. Note that you can add multiple orders to the same shipment. So if you have, have uh, other different PCBs to order, add them using the add new item button. That way you only end up paying for one lot of postage. So finish the order and pay and then wait for that parcel to arrive from China. I mentioned that there are a few parts that needed to be hand soldered. Uh, you'll need to buy these separately. I've created a separate document which is in GitHub explaining the parts you're likely to need. The quantity column is just for a single board so you'll need to multiply that up by the number of boards you've ordered. You need to order these from an electronic component supplier. LCSC is a sister company to JLC PCB um, and the catalogue numbers are given. I've also included the catalogue numbers for Digi DigiKey. In the UK I often find that the local company is much cheaper than LCSC for the tiny chips so it's definitely worth shopping around. Uh, you'll also need some JST cables to connect between the modules and the controller. These cables have a JST PH2 connector on them. Uh, they're not that easy to find uh, completely assembled. I did find these on Amazon uh, which could be soldered together to make the cables you need. I'll put a link, link in the description. If you're uh, assembling the cables make sure that they go straight through. That is pin 1 goes to pin 1 and pin 2 goes to pin 2. You can build your own cables um, but they, the connections are so small it's very difficult to do. If you are ordering online, just make sure that they are the 2mm version of the socket. There are lots of different types of these connectors around, so be careful. And one last warning, you will need cables for the power leads to the modules. However, nearly all the pre-made cables I found have the red and black cables the opposite way around to DIY BMS. So please be careful when you order and make sure you either swap the cables over um, or you get the right ones to start with. So now you have your parcel from China and all the other parts you need to build and finish off the cell modules. So let's do that now. First we're going to fit the uh, at tiny chip. If you've never done any, any soldering before, take a look on YouTube for tutorials. You will uh, definitely want to practice on some scrap boards before you start this. I find it easier to use solder paste and hot air soldering for the at tiny, but for this video I'll assume you don't have those. I'm going to apply some electrical soldering flux. This is not the same as plumbing flux you get for fixing water pipes. Make sure you get pin 1 of the chip in the correct location, top left. There is a tiny little dot on the chip to align with. Now I'm just going to solder on one leg of the chip to make sure that it's aligned. At this point we can still nudge the chip around to align it if needed. So get it perfectly aligned and then go around using a tiny amount of solder on each leg. If you get too much solder and bridge the two legs together, don't worry for now. Now check that all the pins are connected and the solder looks bright and shiny. You'll need a microscope or a magnifying glass to help you with this. If you did end up joining two legs together, try reheating the legs with a soldering iron and dragging the solder off. If that doesn't work, you can put a piece of wire or solder braid on top of the joint, heat it up and remove the excess. That's the tricky part over and done with. So now we can add the last two components. I'll do the JST sockets first. There are four of those in each module. I find a piece of uh, blue tack or something similar helps to hold the circuit board and the connector while I'm soldering. Repeat this for each of the connectors. Finally, we move onto the six pin connector used for programming the module. Again, I'll use blue tack to assist and uh, solder it on. So that's the first module done. All you've got to do now is repeat it again for the other 14 modules. Um, obviously you need to buy enough modules uh, to suit your circumstances. You may only need 6 or 8 or 12 or 14. Um, you are limited a little bit by what uh, JLC will, will uh, ship. Um, but you don't need to order 15 if you don't need them. All we're going to do with this is solder a JST connector and some wire to the sensor and wrap it in heat shrink or insulation tape.
Before you connect a module for the first time, it's a good idea to check with the multimeter that there are no short circuits. Use the lowest resistance or continuity mode on your multimeter and check the positive and negative connections on the module. Turning it over is the easiest way to get to these connections. Hopefully there isn't a low resistance. If there is, it means that there is a short circuit somewhere. So don't connect that module to a battery cell. You'll need to uh, recheck all your soldering joints very carefully. This step puts the DIY BMS module code into the microcontroller. We need to use an AVR programmer. The new controller has one built in, but as I'm not using that in this video, we'll use a USB ASP programmer. These are readily available on the internet. I'll put a link in the description to one on Amazon. You need one with a six pin adapter. Over on uh, GitHub, there are uh, two repositories of code, one for the new controller and one for the old. Alongside these, there are also the code for the modules. It's important to use the module code associated with the controller you are using, as they may differ over time. In this case, I'm using the old style controller. What we're about to do now is also included in the instructions on the GitHub page. Go to the releases section and download the latest release. When we open the zip archive, we're looking for the module code for the version 440. Extract the file out onto your computer. Now on the programmer, we're going to move the jumper pin um, to 3.3 volt instead of the 5 volt. This will stop the module going into bypass as soon as we power it on. So also make sure that the module is completely disconnected from any battery um, and the uh, transmit and receive connectors should also be unconnected. We're going to connect the programmer to the module using the 6 pin ISP connector on the module. Take great care to ensure pin 1 is aligned to pin 1 on the programmer. Uh, pin 1 is actually marked on the PCB board. Now we're going to download the program called AVR Dude. Again, if you look at GitHub, it'll give you uh, links to uh, the versions of Windows and other operating systems. So we're going to download that and extract it. Now we do need to make a little change to this because the standard tool doesn't include support for the, the AtTiny841 chip that we use in the module. So what we're going to do is download a different config file and then overwrite the one that we've got. Again, all the instructions for this are on the uh, GitHub page, so don't worry too much about keeping up with the video. So opening up a command prompt, we can now check to see if we've got connectivity to the module. And for this, we run the AVR do command as, as on the screen, and it will basically ping the, the module and make sure that it can talk to the chip. All being well, it should report similar, something to similar to what's on the screen. If not, check the wiring and ensure you're using the correct COM port. On uh, Macs and uh, Linux PCs, the uh, COM port um, will be something like slash dev TTY, um, but um, that really does depend on the machine you're using. Now we'll program the module. Run the command similar to uh, what's on the screen, replacing the DIY BMS module firmware 400 file name where applicable. The few settings are really important. Um, version 4.4 uses different few settings to all the other boards. You can see what the few settings should be. It's actually part of the file name. So in this case, for the 4.4 boards, you've got E4, F4, HD6, and L is 6C. Uh, those are hex codes for the, the various E fuse, H fuse, and L fuse settings. Um, I know this all sounds very, really complicated, but it's it's much simpler than you th than you think when you actually look at it. All being well, AVR dude will return success, and that's the module programmed. So now I'm going to connect the module to the controller. I've got my JST cables for the two, two communication lines and one for the power input. It's really important that you connect the communications cables correctly or you could damage the module or the, or the controller. The uh, transmit TX line on the controller goes to the RX or receive on the module and then the TX on the module goes back to the receive on the controller. This forms a loop. The power cable is plugged into the bottom of the module. Please make sure you have the positive wire on the right hand side of the module. If you're using the external temperature sensor, that goes onto this socket here. 
on initial power up the module should blink its LED a few times and then when it's successfully communicating with the controller it will blink as, as it receives data. Over on the web interface we can see the module has been found and the internal and external temp temperature is being read correctly. Okay, I think that just about wraps this one up. We've covered a lot of information in this video and I hope you enjoyed it. So, see you in the next one.